Good day and welcome everybody to the Chesapeake Food Shed Network's Coffee Talk series, Learning and Connecting for Action. My name is Yona Sipos and I direct the program development for the Chesapeake Food Shed Network, which is coordinated by Local Concepts LLC, a consulting firm providing the development and backbone support for the CFN. <clears throat> Before we jump into the coffee talk, I'll just provide a very brief overview of the CFN. The Chesapeake Food Shed Network is a group of organizations, businesses, funders, agencies, and other change agents working across the Chesapeake watershed to build a stronger and more resilient food system. We are a relatively new initiative, about two years in the making. The leadership group that spurred the network's development did so because they recognized that a great deal of extraordinary work was being done to advance our regional food system, but there was no entity intentionally trying to build connections, trust, and relationships among those out there doing the work. So the mission of the CFN is to catalyze connections and collaborations that help build a sustainable, resilient, inclusive, and equitable regional food system in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. We believe that by catalyzing connections and collaborations, we are stronger together such that we can help to accelerate change in our food system. We encourage conversation and connection in various ways, including via social media. Please note the usernames and hashtags at the bottom of the slides, and we would love to see your tweets. So here is a picture of our network building blocks. The foundation of our network is all about building connections, getting to know one another, sharing information and knowledge, building relationships and trust with the thought that as we know one another better, we might over time see opportunities to align and to work collectively toward action. We invite anyone who supports our vision of a sustainable, resilient, inclusive, and equitable regional food system to participate in the Chesapeake Food Shed Network. The CFN Coffee Talks are funded by the Town Creek Foundation and are a platform within the network um, to help catalyze connections around specific food system topics. We partner with resource experts who provide a quick learning opportunity through a webinar presentation. And then during the webinar and in the follow-up materials, we identify ways for people to continue to engage and dig in deeper around the particular topic. Today's coffee talk is an opportunity for all of us to learn more about farm to child care as it's being practiced in Western Tidewater, Virginia. We are absolutely delighted that at last count, over 120 people from across the US had registered for the coffee talk. Clearly the issues and discussion around farm to child care, it's hitting a nerve around how to bring fresh farm produce to the younger crowd, particularly in child care environments. The presenters today include three individuals committed to bringing fresh foods to babies and children in childcare, Marissa B. Spady and Nora Farrell from the Planning Council and Jake Browder from Browder's Fresh Pickens, LLC. I'll introduce the presenters in just a moment, but first I'll note just a few housekeeping items. If you have questions or comments during the webinar, please type them into the questions box in your GoToWebinar control panel. We'll be collecting your questions and we'll share them with our presenters following their presentation in a question and answer period. Next week, we will share a recording of the presentation, any additional questions that we didn't have a chance to get to today, resources, contacts, and a post-webinar survey, which we would be very grateful if you would fill in with your feedback and insights. So with that, um, I will share the bios of our presenters and then turn it over to them. Marissa Spady is a registered dietitian and nutrition specialist with the Planning Council in Norfolk, Virginia. She's the program manager for the Farm to Child Care program, where she connects local farmers to local child care programs in the Western Tidewater area of Virginia through menus, taste tests, CSAs, produce fundraisers, fundraisers and community gardens. Through grants with Nemours CDC, she has worked with individual child care centers to help them make long-term action plans toward healthy changes in their programs. Nora Farrell, MPH, is a management analyst with the Planning Council in Norfolk, Virginia. Her primary role is to research and analyze data from secondary sources such as Census, CDC, and the USDA to present to community stakeholders. She also manages and coordinates the evaluation of farm to child care of the farm to child care program in Western Tidewater. Jake Browder of Browder's Fresh Pickens. Um, LLC in Smithfield, Virginia, has been farming 
for five years and raises five acres of specialty crops, such as high tunnel tomatoes, sweet potatoes, blackberries, pumpkins, shiitake mushrooms, strawberries, and other delicacies. Prior to that, Jake attended Virginia Tech in Blacksburg, Virginia, and received a bachelor's and master's degree in horticulture. He worked as a soil conservationist with USDA NRCS for six years and was a Peace Corps Ag Extension agent in the Dominican Republic for two years. And just a note about Browder's Fresh Pickens LLC, it's the dream of a young couple coming true. They understand the importance of hard work, service, building relationships, and living a healthy and earth-friendly life. With those values in mind, they started Browder's Fresh Pickens to provide our community with a variety of locally grown, delicious, and healthy products. And they guarantee you won't be disappointed. So prepare to taste the goodness. And we're just, uh, I will say, we're just um, especially excited to have Jake on the line today um, to get a farmer's perspective as well. And so as I switch over our slide to our presenters, which is just taking a moment, <laughs> um, I'll just say that we are so delighted to have the three of you here today um, for the presentation. And whenever you're ready, please take it away. Okay, thank you, Yona. Can you hear us? Yes, you sound great. Okay, great. Um, first of all, we want to thank um, the CSM for inviting us to today's webinar. We really appreciate it. We're so excited to be here. Um, this is Nora Farrell, and I have Marissa and Jake here with me, who you'll hear from a little bit later on. Um, as you know, we'll be talking about the Farm to Child Care Program here that we've implemented from the planning phase, um, and now we just started year two of the implementation. Um, so you'll hear the history of how we came to this program through emerging opportunities of other services we provide at the um, Planning Council. We'll then go into what is farm to child care and you'll, you'll hear our specific um, goals and objectives and some of the pilot activities that we're actually implementing. At the end, you'll get some tools and resources and we're happy to answer any questions um, that you may have. So first of all, we just want to get an idea um, of how everyone here at the webinar is related to farm to child care. Um, so are you a part of it? Um, so I think we're going to put a poll up. And we'll just and leave it, it up for another five seconds or so. Oh, okay. Okay, I'm going to close the poll and share the results. And it looks like 49% are part of a farm to child care or farm to school program, and 51% are not. So pretty evenly split. Okay. Great. Thank you so much for participating in that. So now here, um, just so you have a little bit of background information on um, the type of organization we're with, um, the Pl Planning Council is a planning organization. We're based out of Norfolk, Virginia. We have an office in Maryland also. It's a planning organization that is involved in community assessment, homeless prevention, and child care resource and referral. So under the child care part, um, we're also a USDA CACFP sponsor uh, for child care centers and home day providers. This is in Virginia and Maryland. The CACFP program allows providers to be re reimbursed for meals that they serve. We saw this as an opportunity to work with providers that we already had relationships with um, to help them serve the most healthy food possible and to look at childhood obesity prevention. Um, so that gave us an opportunity that led to the Healthy Kids, Healthy Futures program and now the F2CC program, which is Farm to Child Care. So here, um, the Healthy Kids, Healthy Futures program started in 2012. Um, Marissa was here when that started. Um, and it was funded through the Obesity Healthcare Foundation. Um, and it was also involved in Western Tidewater. So there was a lot of work put in through this program to develop re relationships with the child care providers. Um, we thought it was a wonderful program and thought everybody would want to participate. Um, however, we found it, it wasn't as easy to get everyone involved. So Marissa put a lot of work into developing these relationships and gaining the trust um, of the providers. We uh, worked with them to measure BMIs and 
um, established nutrition and physical activity policies. So we were able to measure uh, 700 children ages 2 to 5 um, that were in child care programs in Western Tabwater. And this showed that we had a 32% rate of overweight or obese preschoolers. <clears throat> Um, so as you know, we all, um, the childhood obesity epidemic is large and many of us are trying to tackle it through different um, avenues. This slide shows a sample of the physical activity and nutrition policies. Um, through the Healthy Kids Healthy Futures program, uh, we were able to involve 26 centers um, that had 1,700 children, 35 family homes who had 215 children. So. Um, they assessed where they were, um, if they could implement these policies, and um, so this would lead to impacts that would last for a long time. Um, so this program also allowed the Planning Council to implement various trainings for providers to educate and increase awareness about physical activity and nutrition. So you can see that some of these programs through um, the USDA, Share Our Strength, Color Me Healthy, I Am Moving, I Am Learning, were able to um, pr be provided to the providers. Um, these trainings were also um, given to the providers in a way for um, business development and to increase the quality of care. So now we're... Um, we're going to go into what is farm to child care. Um, now that you've had a little bit of background of how we came to this program and the idea of it. So it connects local food producers and processors with the providers um, or the school kitchen or cafeteria. Uh, we've now narrowed, our da narrowed down our program to three core areas, which is gardening, education, and procurement. You'll hear a little bit more about this from Marissa, but um, Many ideas were tried in the pilot phase, um, and so we decided to narrow it down for the providers because they may not want to participate in all three of those activities. It's targeted toward children with ages 0 to 5, um, child care centers, preschools, Head Start, daycare centers, and in-home care. Um, so these are the goals that we came about um, for our specific program. And the overall goal is to increase local economic activity, decrease childhood obesity and hunger, and sustain our food system. So how can we create this in a way that once we step out of it, that we've created a system between the farmers and the child care providers? Um, the other things were to increase the consumption of fruits and vegetables in children, and if we can make it local, even better. Um, we also found that we wanted to increase access to healthy, affordable foods and develop and enhance a community network that will connect farmers to consumers. So we kind of did this backwards. Um, but so those goals, our whole vision from those goals and objectives was to c create a community-wide sustainable program. So how do we create that system? Um, how do we make the, the movement of community responsibility? So how do we make the community take that ownership of this program and want to buy from the local farmers? Um, to create policies for lasting change. Um, and how do we help some of these farmers and the providers take down the barriers of getting the local produce? Sometimes it was just knowledge and sometimes it was um, transportation issues. So overall, we just want to have healthy citizens and a healthy community. So um, initially, we had a planning grant from the OBC Healthcare Foundation for one year. Um, we were able to look at some of the USDA and the CDC um, secondary data. And we found that there was a huge um, lack of access to fresh fruits and vegetables. The so fresh food can equal healthy food, um, and we found that this opportunity right now with the farm to school network and the farm to school movement, we could easily increase um, that movement from the child cares going into the schools so that they would already be ready for those programs. Um, so nationally, 8.4% of the preschoolers were obese. 
Um, and then locally, as we said earlier, 32% of our preschoolers were overweight or obese. Um, so these were all reasons of why we thought it was a good idea to go ahead and um, start implementing the Farm to Child Care program. This is just something I, I found interesting. So when we were looking at the local economy, um, where we're not buying huge amounts, but a little bit of uh, a little bit can matter. Uh, um, so if if each household in Virginia purchases ten dollars a week on locally grown agricultural products, it could bring 1.65 billion into the Virginia economy each year. <clears throat> so along with some of our research and looking at the data, um, we also wanted to hear from the people we're actually working with. So we sent out surveys to our farmers and our child care providers. Um, we were able to get 35 providers to return the survey. Um, and we wanted to know where do they shop. So we found that 50% of them were shopping at the club stores such as Sam's or Costco. Um, and none of them bought directly from a farmer, um, but they were interested. So that showed us they just didn't know how to or where to go for that. Um, so a lot of times you can ask kids where their food comes from and they'll say a grocery store. Um, they don't say the ground or the dirt. Um, or a farmer, because that's to them where their parents and their providers buy the food is from the grocery store. So we found that none of our providers already had gardens, so there was some interest in growing their own produce um, and showing kids how the food is grown. Um, and then almost all of them indicated that they would be willing to pick up some of the fresh produce um, if we were able to provide it. So half of these respondents were senders who could have 50 to 250 kids, and the other half were home care providers, which the range of kids could be 5 to 12. Um, so you can see we also asked them what is the biggest barrier um, that prevents child care providers from purchasing Virginia-grown local produce, and 81% of them said it was convenient. So to them, it's easier just to run to the grocery store, grab what they need, and bring it home. Um, and a lot of times that means that it was coming out of frozen packages and just pre-chopped, pre-cooked, and that all they had to do was heat it up. Um, the other one was the budget. So half of them said that their budget prevented them from buying local, um, which for us, some of that was going in and actually um, seeing what the prices were from the local farmers and educating them, them that it could be cheaper. And the, la um, the third one was transportation or the distance to travel. So it was easier not to make two trips and just go to the grocery store and get all of their food at once. <clears throat> this slide shows some of the respondents from the farmer or the grower surveys. So we had six farmers um, in western Tidewater and for our project, we wanted to stay within the same counties as our child care providers. So we had a total of six farmers that we were introduced to um, to start off with. And they were all interested in um, selling to a new market, the child care provider um, centers. Um, they were willing to host tours for staff and administration and policymakers, and they were open to the idea. Most of them were willing to deliver their products. Um, However, we found that transportation can be an issue, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and then the majority would like to expand their market through individual consumers and into the institutions. Um, so now you'll hear from our farmer, Jake Browder, who um, started this program with us. And you'll hear his initial um, involvement and his first thoughts of when we approached him for this program. So I'm Jake. And when uh, Marissa first contacted me about participating with Farm to Child Care, uh, I really wasn't interested. Um, we get contacted by various organizations um, somewhat frequently and, and people wanting donations and people wanting different things and it just seemed like yeah, I didn't know what they were wanting and so I just tended to, to brush them off and uh, my wife
suggested that we that we give it a shot because you know we don't have any trouble growing stuff typically but marketing our products is where the the problem comes in a lot of times you have excess products that you have trouble moving and we also have um, a two-year-old and a four-year-old and so we realized the importance of of um, young children eating healthy so we decided to give it a shot and um, and they were interested in purchasing sweet potatoes from us as well as other products but uh, I'm really glad that we did because it's turned into a, a fabulous relationship um, that's been a win-win for everybody so um, um, I think now we'll um, turn it over to Marissa. She was kind of our boots on the ground, um, developing the relationships between the farmers and the providers um, out in that area. She's from there, and so it was a little bit easier for her. Um, you know, it would have been maybe a little bit more of a challenge had she not grown up there. Um, so now we'll turn it over and we'll switch to the implementation phase. Um, and here's Marissa. All right, uh, thank you all so much for being here today. Um, I am Marissa Spady, and um, I've been involved since the beginning. Um, I've been with the Planning Council almost six years now, and we have come a long way, and I'm excited in the direction that we're going right now. Um, before I get going and talking a, l a little bit about the pilot programs that we have tried that um, I think you'll get a kick out of, um, I would like to pull up the next poll. Yona, if you would be able to put that up there just so we can see who all is here today. People are voting, so we'll just leave it up for another five or six seconds as everybody has a chance to put down their role in farm to child care or farm to school. All right, I can just read out the results here. 2% um, of our participants today are farmers or producers, 6% are child care providers or schools, 42% are nonprofit organizations, 6% are community stakeholders, and 44% are other, have other roles. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. That gives us an idea um, of who all is in the audience today. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, if you would, our slogan for the first year of our implementation was one sweet potato at a time. Um, that is Jake delivering 40 pound boxes of sweet potatoes in my backyard. Um, as we were transferring, they were there. You will see that there are multiple uses for sweet potatoes in the farm to child care arena. Um, and that's just a quick view of what that looks like. Um, just as a brief summary, um, I will run through some of the ideas that we tried. Um, we had two community engagement meetings where we had approximately 40 people, community stakeholders, um, providers, and farmers attending each of those to learn more about our program. Um, we offered six provider trainings, meaning educational opportunities for child care providers to come and learn about a curriculum or learn how to um, do some gardening on their own. So we offered six trainings for them. Um, we offered technical assistance as we partnered with the Norfolk Botanical Gardeners. A couple of them were able to go out and help with the container gardener, gardens with some of our family home providers. Uh, we attempted to do a CSA for family home providers. We had approximately 21 family home providers across Western Tidewater who participated in a three-week delivery system. Um, we did some menu planning and um, local pro procurement for one of our ch local children's centers organizations. Uh, we did a couple taste tests and food demonstrations. Um, we started the first, and we have now completed the second sweet potato fundraiser, and we have uh, almost finished our uh, full initial harvest, our harvest of the month program that's gone for almost six months. So let's talk a little bit about each of those. Um, in the children's center, um, there are five different sites. The site in Cortland, the young lady who um, was the director had mentioned to me prior to, um, saying that she would love to see fresh produce on their menu. So I said, oh, wait a minute, we might have an opportunity to do that. So um, we sat down, or I sat down with um, the cook staff, the director at that particular site in Cortland, and um, we talked about what produce was available in that time of year. We looked at the month of, this was October planning for November, and um, the items we tried were broccoli, butternut, squash, cabbage, sweet potato, and collards. 
Um, once we figured that out about how much we needed, then I met with our local VDAX representative who pulled two farmers um, that we had kind of been talking to, and um, they split them up um, because they live near to that particular site. Two uh, brought the first two items and delivered directly to the Children's Center. They gave off, they dropped off their invoice, and um, they prepared the items. I was able to uh, visit the day they did the butternut squash, and they said it was a success. They made a casserole out of it. So that was very interesting to observe. The children were trying it, and um, the whole process of the farmer delivering the payment process was definitely done on their end, just so we could see. Um, to follow up from that, we saw that um, there were a few items that were possibly more expensive. Um, I believe the cabbage was a tad bit more expensive um, than what they typically got from Cisco. However, the broccoli, they said, was considerably lower cost value. So um, this is something that we hope will pick up and continue going forward. Um, we did find that some of the items are labor intensive. Um, the collards, being of the early childhood education that they are, they took the collards into the classroom and it became a fine motor activity where the children were able to pull the collars from the stems and so um, they were able to create a new activity out of it. Um, in addition to the Cortland site, um, our staff attended four different uh, fall festivals um, last fall where we gave away approximately 480 pounds of sweet potatoes because of the um, shelf life of sweet potatoes. Um, we, this is a picture of one of our booths. We had bags made. We gave away at least two sweet potatoes per family and um, recipe cards and activity books that were donated from Whole Foods organization. And um, so that, and then we got some information from them as far as a brief survey, but that was allowing the families to take the sweet potatoes home after the children had already expo been exposed in the classroom. Um, when we pilot the Small Community Supported Agriculture, or CSA, delivery program, we had 21 family home providers who said they would be interested. We had two, um, actually I think it was actually three farmers on that one. Um, but what we did was we found three of the home providers in the region that would act as the drop-off pickup locations. And um, so they had three weeks in a row where um, they would receive the, the bags or the box or whatever it might have been um, and then the other providers were called or text or email to go pick them up early that week so that they could use them in the in during that week for the children to try. You'll see a picture of that little guy. Um, he's eating some sweet potatoes that were fixed during that week but they got a variety of whatever was available that the farmers had um, between myself and um, the VDAX um, Virginia Department of Agriculture um, staff. She was dropping off to the three sites and then they were able to pull in together. We got wonderful feedback. Everyone loved it. We sent out a survey. They said they'd be willing to duplicate it. Um, they'd be willing to pay a certain percentage because with grant funds we want to show the sustainability. How are they going to be able to um, you know, keep this going after we're done? So when we went to try this again in the summer um, with them paying a portion um, and have them sign up on our online, sign up on our web page, unfortunately we had a very low number of people to do that. So we weren't we didn't duplicate it again in the summer. Um, however, maybe with some tweaks, that might be an opportunity going forward. Um, the next one is the sweet potato fundraiser and um, pre-sale item. So I approached St. Andrew Preschool, who um, they have been pretty involved in our Healthy Kids for Healthy Futures program um, for the past several years. We have a good relationship with them, um, and overall, they they're pretty open to trying new things. Um, so when my daughter, who had just started kindergarten last year, came home with Yankee Candle and candy and wrapping paper fundraising, I just thought, I don't want to buy this overpriced stuff. And I said, well, Jake's got all these sweet potatoes. Why couldn't we sell these sweet potatoes as a win-win for everyone? He could sell the sweet potatoes. The school would make, a pr make some additional funds for whatever they might need. And then, um, we know that families would be going home with a healthy food item, and we also send home recipes. And so from this point, I'm going to send this over to Jake and let him talk a little bit about um, the fundraising idea with the sweet potatoes. So it's basically where you, I'm selling um, the sweet potatoes at a wholesale price to the organization, and then they're selling them for a retail price to their, their customers, and they're pocketing the difference as the fundraiser uh, profit. And so, you know, I'm happy to get the wholesale price 
um, the customers would be paying retail anyway if they bought stuff at the grocery store. They just happen to be buying it in bulk, and it's fresh and it's local, and and the organization makes the profit. So it's really a win-win for everybody. Um, it's best if it's done on a pre-order system, uh, especially if the crop has been uh, already harvested in this scenario, for example, sweet potatoes where they're they're gotten up out of the field and I know how many I have ahead of time. For example, you know, hundreds of bushels uh, are sitting in the barn and, and you've got them and then you can just deliver them. Uh, we had a little bit of an issue with strawberries um, trying to do um, a similar thing with strawberries and there was a pre-order of strawberries this May, and I don't know if you all remember this May, but there was a whole lot of rain. Uh, it seemed like every weekend in May, it was rain, rain, rain. But um, the crop didn't do what I was expecting it to do, and I had a bunch of pre-orders. And um, so I was trying to um, give that order to a buddy of mine, another farmer, and there was just some logistical issues with that. So. You know, there can be issues with um, logistics in this process, and the communication is very important and that sort of thing. So the point there is just make sure, you know, you dot your I's and cross your T's with this. But um, um, in general, everybody has been happy with the overall result and um, you know, there hasn't been any complaints. So. No, not at all. In fact, um, St. Andrew has actually just finished um, their second year of the fundraiser with the sweet potatoes, and they almost doubled the amount. So I think last year That's they were right. at about 33 boxes of sweet potatoes sold. So the school profited about $330 this year. I think after they've called back and gotten a few extra boxes, we're mm -hmm. up to like 58 boxes of sweet potatoes sold. That's $580 for a preschool. The school has about 75 children. And I asked the, direct, the director, you know, just for um, our own knowledge, you know, how much money do you make off of other fundraisers? Um, and for a preschool of about 75, she says, you know, they might make um, $300 off of a book sale or an activity, um, but they made $580 off of selling sweet potatoes, which we, I have created the power, um, the order form and the flyers, get it approved by them. They print it off, hand it out. They collect the form, let Jake or I know how many to bring, and he drops them off, and it's super easy. The sweet, um, and yeah, and everyone has been pleased. The sweet potatoes are delicious. Um, I think the thought process is that people are probably going to buy sweet potatoes anyways because they will um, be good for so long. I think um, you know people don't realize they'll be good for months if you just keep them in a cool, dark place. Um, the strawberries, on the other hand, um, when they approached me about wanting to do strawberry pre-sale, the initial was, are you hoping to do this as a fundraiser? And the great comment that that director said was like, no, we met Jake. We know he grows strawberries. We just want to support Jake. And the culture that has been created at St. Andrew Preschool is just fabulous in the fact that they just want to grow healthy children, a healthy community, and they want to support their local farmer. And ultimately, that is what we want to have happen for all of the programs. Um, so even if it's just one at a time, um, we'll eventually get there. OK. Um, so moving on from the fundraiser idea um, is some of the taste tests you will see here. Um, that's me with the apron on talking about more sweet potatoes. So we approached Southampton Academy in Cortland, Virginia about, um, you know, would you be interested in trying a taste test? So we dropped off two boxes of sweet potatoes. We gave them recipes to the cook staff and they made sweet potato, baked sweet potato fries and sweet potato parfaits. Um, we went in during lunch one day after they had prepared it. We did a little spiel. We let them try the two options. We found that the older children, we went up to fifth grade at this particular school, and the older children like the fries, and the younger children like the sweet potato parfait with yogurt. Um, each child went home that day with a bag of sweet potatoes, a recipe, and a note to their parents letting them know that these were local sweet potatoes that they got to try. Um, another activity that happened at another school, Liberty Baptist, was um, more along the line of a food demonstration, meaning that their cook staff had prepared all the food items 
Um, and then the students came in and actually did put the recipe together. So there was math, there was science, measuring, um, and they prepared the sweet potato parfait and that was going to be served as snacks to the rest of the school later that day. Um, this is a, a random email I got from one of our family home providers. You'll see her there with her, her children. And they have one small um, container garden that we've helped her uh, manage. And this is just a note that she sent us. And she's just thankful that they've had the opportunity to grow so many different things um, from this one pot. And we've had, like I said, I think we've been out twice last year just to help her get started and keep it going. But she's really embraced the whole idea of um, helping the kids understand where their food comes from and incorporates in her menu. Um, this is a picture of a uh, children's center located in Suffolk, Virginia. Um, Suffolk has a program called Healthy Suffolk and within that they have a garden um, program. And so we partnered with the Healthy Suffolk garden coordinator, Shelly Barlow, and um, after having met with the um, the director of health at Children's Center, they, and she just mentioned in conversation, I'd love to have a garden, and I said, hold that thought. And within a month later, we had um, two raised bed gardens being put in, and the children got to help plant that those seeds and some of those plants. And um, they've let us know that over the summer, they've incorporated many of the herbs into their food, um, and the children, it's right on their playground, so it's actually functional um, and very easily accessed. Um, the Harvest of the Month program was an idea that um, Nora and I saw when we went to the National Farm to Institution uh, Conference in Wisconsin. Um, and so there are several Harvest of the Month programs um, throughout the country that we've kind of adapted to our growing season. Our growing season is a little different, than, well, obviously different than other areas across the country. So I took my list right here of June through November and I ran it by Jake and he said, well, you're pretty close, but he made me switch the sweet potatoes and the broccoli. But each month, for those uh, months that you see right there, um, June through November, um, the children, eat, there are seven centers that signed up to participate, which is approximately between 400 and 450 students at any given time during those months. And um, they would receive one delivery of the amount of uh, produce for their particular school. They would receive an email about a week before with activities and um, for them to participate in, and then a, a handout for the parents. Once the, so the parents could read and understand what their kids were doing. Um, if there were extras, many of the schools have sent the extra produce home with parents, so parents understand um, what's been going on. And then there was an, also a um, survey at the end for us to get feedback from the child care program teachers as well as directors, and we've had really positive um, responses from this. So um, that's been really good. I'm going to turn this next one over to Nora because this was something that she really um, was excited to get started. Okay, so um, the Apple Crunch of Palooza came from the Farm to Institution Conference also that we attended in June. Um, and we were able to partner with Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services for this effort. Um, they really made it, they were able to make it statewide versus just here regional for us. Um, and so they were looking at a way to celebrate Farm to School Month um, and how do we get it out there to everyone in the community. Um, so we were able to make a website and a registration page. The reason why we did the registration page um, wasn't necessarily so that people could pay or figure out. We just wanted to know how many people were doing it. Um, so it was a social media campaign where we encouraged everyone to buy um, Virginia grown apples and crunch into the apples at the same time. Um, take a picture and post it with hashtag or if they didn't want to do it on Facebook or um, Instagram, they could email it in to us. Um, so this was just kind of a way for us to get it out there statewide versus community wide. Um, and we had over 24,000 people register and I think that was about 50 organizations all together. Um, so it was a way of increasing awareness of buying local and eating healthier. Awesome. So we heard that some of you also participated in our Apple Crunch, so we're excited to have seen your pictures. Um, we've tried to alert the media whenever we had something fun and exciting going on. Um, and this is uh, one of the articles in the Smithfield Times um, of our first month of Harvest of the Month at Isla White Academy. Um, during the summer, they have a summer program with children of all different ages, and so they received their 
um, cucumbers. We had recipes and they tried those. They colored their cucumbers. You'll see the pictures and there's the kids with myself and I standing there with our bag of, and they're holding up their cucumbers. So parents were really got a kick out of being able to have cucumbers come home with them. One of the feedback that we got from one of the other children's centers was that children had never seen cucumbers or had fresh local cucumbers before and then making the connection between a pickle and a cucumber was mind-blowing for some folks as is the connection between tomato and ketchup and spaghetti sauce um, that was something else that we heard that was um, an epiphany for some children um, some of the challenges however it's not all been fun and games that's for sure um, that we have seen is um, changing the mindset of some of the providers um, and helping them to understand um, as they look at the quality of the child care program that they're offering, thinking about not only the child's, of course, their safety and their education program and, and that type of thing, but also think about the child as a whole and helping them to understand the importance of nutrition and, and helping kids understand where their food comes from is important. Um, but I know they have a lot on their plates, and so this is just one more thing, I think. Um, delivery of produce from farmer to child care. Um, you know, in some cases, um, Jake was able to build that relationship because he went and met face to face with Miss um, Carol at St. Andrew. So that's how he, you know, by seeing that person, were able to develop that relationship, but not some of these. So, oh, go ahead. so um, with the, from a farmer perspective, with delivery. You know, you're willing to make a delivery if it's in bulk, but if the delivery is like a small delivery or if you've got a whole bunch of, of child care facilities all spread out all over uh, several counties, you're, you're less likely to do like one box here and one box there, but if it's a whole truckload, you know, you will do that. So that's, that's sort of what, what she's talking about. Yeah, so that, that's where um, Nora and I have been the deliverers of uh, a lot because as you know, child care programs are serving anywhere from 40 to 120 kids. It's not like a school system where you have hundreds of children. So the, the quantity is not as many and then you've got them spread sporadically. Um, the Western Tidewater area of Virginia is a fairly rural area. And so there can be great distances between, um, I think it takes us about three hours to do pick up drop off for all seven locations. Um, and then as far as sustainability and scale, we are just trying to um, increase awareness uh, of the program. And um, I'm hearing that it's getting out thanks to webinars like this. Um, our website, we have a video and we've hoping, we've shared it on our social media and things of that nature, going and talking to community organizations. Um, but I think one idea with the fundraiser, um, a lot of times the programs, when I talk to them about sustainability, they're like, well, we have to be able to budget for it, and I've got to pay for all the stuff that I have to have. So the fundraiser was an idea to say, um, well, if you're willing to try this fundraiser idea, this is how much it's made at different schools. Um, if you could have, if we could put your garden in for you and you have this as fundraiser, um, you should be able to, you know, pay for your harvest of the month deliveries as well as be able to pay for your garden upkeep and whatnot. And so, so those are some of the challenges in, in broaching the topic. Um, so what's next? What do we do after this point? Um, so it depends on who you are and, and what, how, what your capacity of being involved in is. Um, if you are a nonprofit, um, how do you get grants to help you get started? How do you build those relationships? And we found time and time again that relationships are truly um, the most important part of being able to get things going. Um, and then a lot of times we've actually talked on the state level in Virginia. Um, a lot of child care programs are actually doing some portions of these um, farm to child care activities. So sometimes it's an opportunity for us to um, make it go a little bit smaller scale or, or maybe make it broader. So I'm thinking I'm getting a sign from Yona that I need to wrap things up. Is that right, Yona? I think there's just a, there's still a few more minutes, but we want to just leave some time for a Q&A at the end. Thanks. Okay. Well, um, so I will just flip over um, some of the other ideas for field trips, um, brochures about who your farmers are in the area, um, making those relationships with them, reaching out to your local um, uh, other organizations that or would support the same idea. Um, engagement opportunities in the, um, in the community. 
um, adopting a child care center. Um, there are many more organizations that are always looking for a way to um, donate their time, donate money. Um, maybe they just want to go in and read books about produce, um, or they want to support with the Harvest of the Month. Maybe they want to do deliveries for you, or maybe they want to share the word of the Child and Adult Care Food Program, which can help um, with some funding. So um, those are some opportunities going forward of ways that we could potentially um, build funding for. These are some of the questions that we've also used in the past of, um, so how do we get the farmers to buy their sales? Like, what if we were able to partner with a local school that's doing farm to school? How could our child care providers be part of that um, buying in bulk? Uh, maybe they order through them and get a lower price. Um, how do we get enough to meet the needs for the schools? Um, would farmers ever consider growing mass one particular item? So if we went to Jake and said, Jake, we need so many um, pounds of sweet potatoes, we just have to have that commitment up front. And then how do we overcome seasonality? And these are just some ideas just to think about wherever you're, you're located and how these items might come across. Um, if you're interested in starting a, a farm to child care program, um, the Grow It, Try It, Like It kit is one of our um, resources. You'll find it on the USDA um, team nutrition page that's available. Starting a garden, um, get in touch with your extension agent. Um, take a field trip to a local farmers. Invite your farmer to come to the classroom, but just know that farmers are busy people, and um, I haven't quite gotten a farmer into the classroom yet, but that is on the books for the next year. Um, trying a taste test. Um, and if local produce is not grown abundantly, just getting more fresh produce in front of the children because the more, like, the more often that they are introduced to it at a young age, the more likely they are to continue it um, eating produce as they get older and hopefully can live a healthier lifestyle. So I believe that is about the end. These are some of the feedback from some of our participants. And I guess I'll turn that over to Yona for any questions. Great. Thank you so much. I'm just going to um, switch this back and I'll put up the um, resources that you were just talking about. I'm not sure why, if everybody saw them, it didn't quite show up on, on my screen. So let me just back us up for a minute here. So here was some feedback um, just to make sure everybody had a chance to see it. Feedback from participants. Um, and I'll just leave that up for, for just a moment and say that we have a lot of questions. So people ha are very excited about this. A lot of congratulations coming in and um, excitement about all that you're, you've accomplished so far. Um, but I'll just start with the question here about, um, there are two questions. Um, one is, oops, sorry. A bit of technical trouble on my end, one second. Um, Okay, let me start with this. So the qu question was actually, um, as I go back to the last slide, um, what kind of data or feedback have you gathered from children, families, providers, and farmers? Example, BMI, revenues from farmers, et cetera. So other, other types of feedback or data. Um, okay, so I guess this goes into evaluation. Um, so this has been a tricky part. Um, the Farm to School Network does have um, a new tool, it's Evaluation for Transformation, um, and it divides ways to measure farm to school on a statewide level so that everyone is talking the same language. Um, so at first, this was a lot of, we knew we needed to evaluate, but a lot of it is just talking and hearing back from the participants. So we know that we're not going to change BMIs alone, and we're not going to change it within the next year. So that is something um, we have not been focusing on right this second. We do have those initial measures. Um, and it takes a lot of funding to be able to measure that many kids to understand it. So we understand that BMI is important to know if there is results. Um, but other ones have just been pre and post surveys, and is this successful? How many children are we reaching? How many children get activities throughout the month? Um, how many parents are being involved? And are parents now asking for the farm to child care program when they approach the child care providers? Um, hopefully that answered the question. And, and from a farmer perspective, I mean, I've got several thousand dollars more 
in my cash flow because of it. So, I mean, it's a positive from from my side. That That's a good, so we do keep track of how many pounds of local produce and how much money we do spend. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, I'll just uh, deal with a couple of um, questions I can answer. People want to know if the slides will be emailed out. Uh, and yes, the slides will be emailed out as well as a, a link for the recording. And we'll be sending that out um, early or middle of next week. So um, don't worry about writing all the resources down on the, from the screen. Um, you will all get a copy of this. So I have a question now for Farmer Jake. Um, <laughs> Farmer Jake, are you GAP certified? And is that a requirement in Virginia to sell to institutions? I'm not GAP certified. Um, I was very close to becoming GAP certified, um, but it's not a requirement. Um, and so because it was not requirement, I did not follow through with doing it. Um, it was, it was going to be, um, I basically am following the practices in the GAP certification, but without paying for the, the um, person to come out and certify me. Mm -hmm. And that's what we've found with a lot of the farmers is um, it's a very expensive certification, um, but a lot of them do follow the practices, but they aren't actually certified. Great. Thank you so much. Another question, was Cooperative Extension involved with this project at all? Or were there other um, partners to speak of? Um, they were at some of our meetings, and they have connected us with many of the farmers. Um, I am actually going to be meeting next week with the Master Gardeners and um, hopefully getting them a little more involved because we were piloting so many um, different ideas. It was kind of hard to um, plug them in directly. And in our area, um, we don't necessarily have um, like a, I can't remember what the name of the agent is, a uh, food nutrition agent in Isle White right now, I don't believe. And so, um, Janet is just a, ag an ag agent. So, so she's been really grateful about helping um, us come into meetings to meet the farmers. Um, but as far as teachings and whatnot, that has not currently happened. However, because of this project, we have applied for another grant and um, we have been received a grant from Aetna Foundation to expand into Virginia Beach, Chesapeake, Norfolk, and Portsmouth. Um, and with that being said, we just had a meeting with the Chesapeake Extension and some of the programs that they have going and being able to collaborate with them. Excellent. And That's a few excellent. of the other partners mm -hmm. we found helpful um, are linking in with the health department. Um, and there's a lot of healthy city coalitions um, around the area that is helpful to link into just their other efforts so that you're a part of a bigger connection. Um, and I also think we've had we've had a few trainings from Ag in the Classroom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's uh, through Virginia Farm Bureau, uh, the Ag in the Classroom. They come in and they um, teach the class on um, activities they can do in the classroom about helping kids understand where their food comes from and things like that. Great. Um, so just following up with with uh, areas that you're covering, um, somebody's asking, where in Maryland can I look for the same program? How do people find out more? Um, well, currently, uh, the actual Farm to Child Care program is not in Maryland. Um, our organization does have an office up there, but that's strictly for um, our USDA Child and Adult Care Food Program. And so we are always looking for opportunities to expand. However, um, right now, we, we are not there yet. When we were at the Farm to School Network, there the Department of Education was there from Maryland, so that might be um, someone to reach out to. But I think they were more focused on farm to school. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, did you find any providers successfully integrating food-based activities and local produce into an educational curriculum? Well, that's part of what our Harvest of the Month program, so those seven centers that said, yes, we'd like to be your guinea pigs pretty much for Harvest of the Month, um, we would um, send out a monthly email that would have a list of activities, anything from songs to coloring pages to um, activities, a great resource is the Growing Minds um, in uh, Appalachian State area in North Carolina. They have a great resource that they said, feel free to use. 
Um, and so we give them lots of credit for lots of their activities, but our growing season is different, so we have a few different produce items available. Um, but that was a lot of activities that they did. Um, if you watch our video on our website, you can see that what, the month of the cucumber, they read a book about the cucumber and it's something about a race car, and so they made a, a race car out of the cucumber with cherry tomatoes as the wheels. It was really cute. Um, so they paint, they've painted with produce. Um, they've tasted several different recipes, or they've just tried it with ranch dressing. Um, so they are incorporating it that way. They measured themselves. They laid down and they measured themselves with how many squash or maybe it was watermelon, you know, that it was. Or they counted out seeds in their watermelon or things like that. <laughs> Those are all activities that my three-and-a-half-year-old would love. <laughs> um, <laughs> just to follow up with that, on the harvest of the month, who is, who is paying the, for the produce? I'm not sure if you mentioned that in the presentation. So the grant funds, um, for the majority of the program, the grant funds have paid for the produce. Um, I think the, the only other one um, was when they did the procurement for incorporating it in their menu. Um, we wanted to see what it would look like, the whole process of them taking on um, ordering directly from the farmer and having them, the farmer deliver, do the invoice piece and um, with their W-9 for, form to their finance person. And then that way we could compare costs to what they purchased otherwise through Cisco. So um, that was one area that we supported them in lining up the produce and everything, but they actually paid for the produce. But otherwise, everything else has been paid for um, through grant funds. And this is something um, we're looking to explore volunteer and community engagement-wise. Um, can we get Rotary Clubs, can we get women's clubs to adopt certain centers um, to allow them you know, to continue on with the harvest of the month or the fundraisers? Excellent, thank you. Um, we have a question about whether <clears throat> it's possible to share the child care survey that you used originally. Sure. Okay, great. If you would, if you would send it to me, then I'll um, include that in the follow up materials. Thank you so much for that. And we have time for just one last question, and this is um, for Jake. And the question, Jake, is what advice do you have for other farmers interested in providing produce for farm to child care and farm to school? Uh, well, just just good communication, um, you know, planning. Um, if, um, you know, the best thing is uh, non-perishable products work the best. Uh, carrots, beets, sweet potatoes, those sorts of things. Um, the more perishable it is, the, the harder it's going to be. Uh, but, um, you know, pricing, price negotiation is always sort of awkward. Um, quantity, delivery, those sort of things, you know, the higher the quantity, the more you can give them a discount. Um, but just, you know, have a good relationship with the organizers, um, sort of have a go to a point person that's going to do the communication because if you have too many people communicating there can be some confusion um, but but otherwise it's just like dealing with any other um, any other entity a restaurant or um, any other entity um, it can be a great opportunity and just to add on to that um when we go out to the farmers, a lot of times they say, are you looking for donations? And we say, no, 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 um, that is our main priority and focus is we want to give you a fair price um, for the produce. And um, so that's something that we communicate to them clearly up front is we want to pay you what you're getting from other markets. Um, and then also a lot of the farmers, we have to find out what's the best communication system for them. Um, so some of them absolutely do not text, do not email, it's phone call only, and then some of us refer them to their wives. So that's something to find out up front is how do we communicate with you um, the best way. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. And I and I imagine that you know maybe in the future some of some of the farmers might might be referring you to their husbands for communication. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, and anyway, and I just wanted to say in addition, I'm gonna. Um, wrap us up here. But in addition to thanking Marissa, Nora, and Jake for this absolutely fantastic and rich presentation, as well as the Q&A, um, I also want to thank Jake's wife <laughs> for helping to uh, get him on board with this awesome program. Um, 
I've put up uh, Marissa, Nora, and Jake's email addresses. If you have questions, they said you can, um, or additional questions, you can contact them directly. And I'll also share the questions that we didn't get to today. And they'll have a chance to look over them and we'll send out all the questions and any additional responses with all the materials that we'll send out um, earlier mid next week. So um, just wanted to also put up this slide, but again, you'll be, you'll be getting this. Um, the uh, Planning Council's video is up on their main page of Farm to Child Care. It's really an awesome video. I encourage you to check it out. Um, there's also just some more resources on the National Farm to School Network. And um, uh, just a note here that some funding may be available. There's an application um, that's due coming up December 8th for USDA Farm to School funding. Um, so I encourage you to check that out and to follow up with the CFN or with our resource experts from today if you have additional questions on this or on anything else related to farm to child care. And I also wanted to thank all of our registrants and attendees for your interest and for all the questions that you shared today. Thank you so much. Um, if you have any ideas for a, uh, for a coffee talk or a webinar that you or someone that you would, for you to host or someone else to host, then please do be in touch with Christy Gabbard, who's the Director of Local Concepts um, and the Chesapeake Food Shed Network Coordinator. Here's just a couple of upcoming events um, that are coming up in the next few months and even into the spring. We hope to see you um, in future events, and we, we really welcome any questions, any feedback that you may have for us. Um, please also visit our website, chesapeakefoodshed.net, for more information and to register for upcoming events. We really hope that you can join us. Um, one more huge thank you to our resource experts for today and for all of you for your participation. Thank you so much and have a great day. We appreciate it. Thank you. Excellent.